Hi, my name is Michael Bean. I'm a professional film and TV acting teacher, and this is your free lesson for myfreeactingclass.com for Monday, January the 31st. Right now, these lessons are happening every Monday from 5 to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And uh, so if you want to join us live and in person, it means you get to throw your questions into the mix and ask them live and in person. And uh, if you don't have the opportunity to do that, then please feel free to put them into the YouTube comments. Any of the links that I talk about today, I will do my best to post in the notes on when I uh, put this up on YouTube. Yeah, and you can find a link to past videos, etc. right here. Uh, let me find it. There we are. Uh, at uh, myfreeactingclass.com, where you will be prompted to join uh, the mailing list, uh, but you know, uh, only if you want a weekly reminder and a little link with the, the video coming right at you every week. Otherwise, you can come on here. Uh, you can uh, go to myfreeactingclass.com slash video, you know, or you can just uh, click on uh, the here on the main page, zoop, 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 click on the video archive, it'll take you here. And uh, there's a whole bunch of good stuff in here. We're going to watch a couple of little clips of video today because there's some things in the archive that I haven't had a chance to show off uh, to you in a while. And uh, I like a little bit of multimedia, so you're not just looking at my face the entire time. So uh, I had a question from a student by email earlier this week uh, that I want to share some of the details of that answer with you. So And so uh, Ozzy uh, said that he's living in Victoria, BC, and uh, that um, he's considering uh, different options for actor training and asking what advice I had. Um, particularly, in particular, he was looking at a full-time training program in the city of Vancouver, BC uh, called a Vancouver Film School. And uh, the without uh, going into uh, too much detail, you know, I wanted to quickly uh, kind of give you the overview of the answers that I gave him and comparing the different options. You know, so in answer to a specific question, you know, and I'm not affiliated with them at all. And so, you know, if I share my opinion, this is just my opinion. I'm an acting teacher. I've been an acting teacher for about 20 years. I've heard lots of people talk about these things. I have not attended any of these uh, full-time programs that I'm going to reference today. So uh, the Vancouver Film School program specifically, I've heard good things about their program for actual filmmakers and like quite a few of the folks who graduate from their filmmaking programs go on to work professionally. I don't know how it compares to other filmmaking programs because again, not my field of expertise, haven't heard a whole bunch about it, but their acting program specifically, two thumbs down, really, really expensive, way over promises, way under delivers. Anybody I've ever talked to who came out of there was like, wow, I just really wish I had all of that money back so that I could spend it on things that would actually help my career. Uh, now, uh, compare that with uh, what, at least in uh, the in BC or you know, in the in around the city of Vancouver, BC, uh, in Canada, uh, you, is the best uh, full time program, uh, which is again not affiliated with these folks at all. Uh, Studio Fifty Eight uh, at Langara, so that's Langara College, has a three year program called Studio Fifty Eight. And um, as far as I know, it is the best, you know, or at least one of the top two schools for acting in Canada. Now, why would that be? You know, the, it's because it, it falls on, into the very small category of schools uh, that is very selective and uh, conservatory based. So it's, it's actor training as opposed to academic training, you know, and they are auditioning 800 to 1,000 people and taking you know, 20, 22, 24 each semester. You know, so obviously that means that your peer group is much, much more experienced. And uh, as an actor, I can tell you definitively that I, like, I know some of the teachers who work at Vancouver Film School and they are excellent. 
You know, so to me, that says, okay, it's, it's, it's not about the instructors because I know those people, or at least some of them, you know, and they really know what they're doing. To me, that says, okay, there's something about the culture there. You know, obviously the fact that it's wildly overpriced has way more to do with them maintaining a giant campus and you know, having a very big marketing budget, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but if the training isn't doing as much for people, you know, then to me, that says that it's about the peer group, it's about the folks who are attending, you know, and it's about the culture of the place. You know, so haven't been on the inside, cannot speak to the details, just 100%, we would not recommend zero out of 10. Uh, Studio 58 is the only conservatory style training program. Now, in, uh, in, uh, in, in your, my letter to Ozzy, I said, well, if you are going to, basically, if he has some experience uh, from Egypt before moving to Canada in musical theater, and you know, so he's got some experience, he was thinking about uh, you know, sort of what would be the best training options for him. Uh, and I think this this holds whether you are just finishing high school you know, or whether you are you know in your sixties and you know um, retired and wanting you know, to take up acting. You know, the uh, the advice is similar. So let's say, uh, for instance, that you're in a situation where you want a degree and that's going to be useful for your life. I think that for full time programs, uh, that uh, you would. Um, the that you'd pr uh, probably be better off uh, going to a university. You know that uh, you, the University of Victoria. I know very skilled actors who come out of their program. You know, not that the training itself is going to do everything that you need, but three or four years of focusing um, specifically on acting, even if you are also needing to do the sort of academic requirements to get a degree, they you know, are are going to be useful. Also, uh, the tuition typically at a university could be much, much lower uh, than in a private school. So uh, I'll also give you an example of a place in uh, Victoria called the Victoria Academy of Dramatic Arts, not affiliated with them. I don't, I literally know nothing about them except I looked up the tuition on their tuition page and it is something like $13,000 plus taxes, $15,000 for a nine month program. Now compare that to what you'd be paying at the university. The university, you're going to be paying like two to three thousand dollars a semester. You know, the uh, you know obviously the cost is much much lower. Now that full time program is going to, in order to make it seem like a really good idea to spend twice as much, you know, uh, three times as much, four times as much, while also not getting um, credits you know, that you could use towards a degree, which might be useful in other uh, places in your life, they're going to like really upsell themselves. They're going to say, oh, you know, here are some of the like really amazing actors who graduated from our programs. You know, and uh, the truth is, especially once a program gets to a certain size, some folks who go there are going to go on and be incredibly successful. Now, this is, folks have been doing that since the actor's studio, uh, uh, Lee Strasberg, you know, back in uh, like way back in the day, first in New York and then Los Angeles, you know, it was like Marlon Brando, graduate of the actor studio. And Marlon Brando uh, you know, was somebody who, you know, really like sort of railed against that, you know, when uh, it was like, ah, uh, the, it's really normal for acting schools to sort of claim anybody who ever came through their doors, you know, and uh, use them in their marketing, you know, to tout their own success. You know, I think instead you've got to look at how serious is the training program? What are people getting out of it? So let's say you wanted a degree. I think that a degree is not going to, sure not going to hurt you, you know, and can be useful in other avenues of your life. Let's say you wanted to go uh, pursue, uh, get a master of fine arts, for instance. There's some fantastic schools you know, here you know, or in the States where, you, again, you'd be in a much more selected group. Now, that's, uh, so that was one of the other pieces of advice. I was like, okay, Ozzy, if, like, if money is not an issue for you, and, and your goal ultimately is to work in LA, one of the things you could do if you've got a degree is you could go and do an MFA program at you know, UCLA or UC Irvine or one of these programs that, that's got like a, again, uh, competitive, you know, like people are auditioning to get in, you're gonna end up with a highly uh, skilled peer group. It's gonna be very expensive, especially if you're coming from out of country. You know? Now, but that's if you've got the, right, if you've got the, Fifteen twenty thousand dollars a year to spend. You know, instead of going to Vancouver Film School, go somewhere awesome. You know, that's uh, you know, where you're going to be surrounded you know, by highly skilled actors doing highly skilled work. Now, uh, if money is an issue uh, for you, which it certainly is for most of us, 
then uh, think that your best bet, like let's say you're just finishing high school and you're thinking about these options, your best bet is either, like I said, to audition for a performing arts uh, school, you know, uh, go somewhere like Langara that is like specifically focused on actor training, uh, not uh, that's Studio 58 specifically, you know, or uh, to do part-time professional classes, right? And, and when you compare them, they end up about similar, right? So uh, part-time professional class, most of the, the really good ones that I know about are going to cost uh, between, say, $200 and $300 a month, you know, for a weekly class. You know, and so if you are doing, let's say, uh, two of those classes a week, you know, which would be a lot, that would be like um, very few actors uh, I know are uh, doing both of those. But if you were like, yeah, this is like, I'm putting everything I've got into training, probably that's what you would be doing. You know, and so if you were doing two of those part-time professional classes a week, it costs about you know, $600 a month. You know, you sort of expand that out. Oh, okay, that's going to cost you what, like you know, $6,000 a year. If so, it's going to cost you like a little bit less you know, than uh, going to a full-time university program, but not a lot less. Uh, the advantage being that you get to like stay in, uh, the, you basically you can still work, you can still kind of pursue your other creative projects, you can still you know, make a living, you don't have to sort of put everything on pause and, and go to full-time school. But like, I think comparing the cost for most people, like is a legitimate way to help make that decision. You know, the, I get people like really sort of like, oh, but like, what's my best option? Like your best option is to put as much time as you can into acting. You know, and I know that doesn't help you make the decision now about should I do it this way or should I do it that way? Uh, but the, I think that anybody who says, here's the right decision for you uh, is uh, giving advice, you know, and ultimately you've got to decide that, you know, like it's the practice time that's going to get you, like that's what's going to get you where you want to be, uh, in my opinion. So um, that's my plug for, you know, uh, part-time professional classes, you know, for master's programs, you know, for uh, the full-time acting school, you know, one of these like accelerated 10-month programs, it's, again, it's not the instructors are not highly skilled. Like I know people who work in these jobs and they are fantastic actors, they're fantastic teachers. One of the best teachers I know works at a, what I think is like a really like second or even like third string school in uh, Vancouver. And Damn, like I wish that I'd had a space on my staff to hire this guy when I got his resume, you know, uh, when he first moved to Vancouver like 15 years ago, because like he's amazing. Uh, and his students are real, real lucky to have him. You know, and you know, the the peer group in that school is gonna be literally anybody who auditions or anybody who applies. You know, and so what that means is that it's they're just it's going to take them so much time to get past basics you know and it means that if you're attending there you're not going to learn as much from your peers you know so um is that a good expenditure of your money if you're you know like pouring it all into you know 10 months i don't think so personally you know i think that you would be better off taking that and spreading it out over like two three four years of either part-time professional classes you know, or going and doing a, uh, like a conservatory program or, or a degree program, you know, if you can sort of justify that or make that work, you know, with your life. So that's my advice personally. And uh, otherwise, I think maybe you're getting kind of caught up in the hype of folks with a really great advertising department, you know, who are doing a good job of like making it sound like this is your shot, just come to us for 10 months, and then you'll be set. Like, Acting is the kind of thing that is going to take you time to acquire the skill that you need. Uh, and uh, the now, with that said, this thing about you know, like, can I just keep, stay in my life and do two and like do justice to two weekly classes? It's possible, but it is just as much of a grind and just as much focus if you're in um, as if you're uh, taking a full time school program. Very few actors I know have the um, like passion and focus to do that. But the ones who are doing uh, both an on-camera class and a scene study class, typically that's the best combination. You know, one where you are working with theater material, you know, and uh, you know, back when we're allowed to do that again, doing that in person and going you know, in depth on some of the best writing, and then also doing a film class at the same time. That's where I've seen people uh, make the best progress. And I think that's been reflected in my peers who are also acting teachers. 
I guess so. Uh, then uh, then Ozzy asked about uh, acting in Los Angeles. Yeah, and so before I get into uh, what I shared with Ozzy, I also want to uh, show you a quick video from uh, Stuart Aikens, his casting director. You can find this in the video archive on um, the uh, uh, myfreeactingclass.com. So if you go in here, and I did this earlier, just type LA. Okay, oh, actor websites, online auditions, LA versus Vancouver, watch video. Uh, right, so this is just any web browser. You, you uh, hit find, you know, type in what you're looking for here. There's a bunch of stuff. I mean, uh, some of the more recent videos you know, are not on here. It's been a couple of months since I updated this. So if you really want the most current stuff, you go to the YouTube channel. Uh, the, there's a link to that you know, here at the very top of the screen. Da, da, da. Uh, there it is, uh, youtube.com uh, slash C slash Michael Bean. And uh, there's a lot myfreeactingclass.com. So we can flip through here and see all the different things. Uh, now, uh, the first one that I want to show you is this. Now, this is an older video. Uh, Stuart uh, cast, among other things, uh, the Twilight movies and the Cooper back in the day. Now, uh, my understanding is that he is still running the uh, acting program uh, at uh, and the entire film department at the University of Capilano. Uh, in Vancouver, um, but uh, uh, he had a way of um, so sort of not pulling punches and speaking very straight. Me uh, for a while there was coming in and to speak to my students really regularly, and at one point he let me record all of these. So these are some of the uh, the earliest videos on that channel, and I, I really think that they're going uh, they're worth going back and looking at, even though uh, they are from. Uh, 11 years ago now, you know, the, the, so he doesn't talk about self tapes, but I think that what he has to say is still very, very valid. And right, remember, this is somebody who at this point, you know, ha, had spent uh, decades uh, as a full time casting director and been a very, very successful one. Um, contrast between LA and Vancouver. Um, Vancouver is the capital perspective. From an actor's perspective, well, I think that you have to remember that you know you walk into a room here, and there might be you know like two or three people that look like you. You walk into a room in Los Angeles, and there are forty-five, and they look exactly like you. You are no longer special, and also. There, because it's a mecca of everything to do with acting, um, there's a huge amount of competition. And it's a harder place to develop a career than it is than, the, than you have here. here. Uh, and so I just want to quickly speak to that. Um, I have a, a close friend uh, who lives in Los Angeles, and uh, the um, was speaking to her and one of her friends who uh, works at a local acting school you know, in uh, Los Angeles as a, a coach and a teacher. You know, and because truly Los Angeles is known through the entire world as like the place to go uh, if you want to be a film and TV actor, it means that in addition to there being lots of work there and lots of very skilled actors there, it is also flooded with people who have absolutely no idea what they're doing. So not only is there very stiff competition from people who really do know what they're doing, but there also are lots and lots and lots of people who don't know what they're doing. You know, and then I think greatly outnumbering uh, the skilled folks. And so uh, the expectation for a lot of people when they hear somebody's an actor, that, oh, okay, you're, you're one of those people. And so you, you've got to cut through that in a huge market like that in a way that you, uh, you don't necessarily uh, in a smaller market. Here, you can develop a career. You can get smaller parts. You can build out. You can do other material. You, can, you get a chance because directors want to be able to hire people from here because of the financial circumstances. So most often when actors come, come from Vancouver and go to LA, everybody goes, wow, Jesus, your resume is huge. Because it's, they're not used to seeing that in LA. It's hard to get a big resume. You have to be like 40 or 50 years old to have a resume the size of what some people have in their 20s here. It's because they get so much more opportunity. But LA is very, very difficult. And also, LA is fully aware that there are talented people here in Vancouver and are looking here all the time for them. And you could replace in Vancouver in that sentence with 
you know, uh, Atlanta, you know, or uh, New York, you know, or uh, even, you know, uh, like much smaller markets, you know, where, yes, there might only be one or two casting directors, but there are that many fewer highly skilled people who are working there. Right? Like Calgary, for instance, I know some actors who've made their careers from the credits uh, that uh, they got uh, working in Calgary, you know, or in Manitoba, you know, uh, a lot of cowboys. The, the one guy I know who has the most credits, he just got real good at playing cowboys. He was never that way before, but he figured it out just because that's what they kept asking him for. So just because you might not be in LA doesn't mean that you won't have be able to access LA. I mean, once a year during pilot season, every network hires somebody here in Vancouver to show them the most interesting new young or old people that they have for certain things. So there's lots of opportunity for that to happen. And every pilot that's shot in LA is almost always looking here and agents are always self-taping their actors and sending them to the cast of people in LA to the point that a lot of people get parts that way. I mean, that's how Corey Monteith got Glee. His agent put him on tape. They saw it, brought him down, he got a part. They were having problems finding that role, couldn't find it. They went back in, reviewed his stuff, when that's a possibility, he came back down. Now he's a big star. He was doing a series for me called Kaya for um, Nickelodeon. Okay, so uh, something that is relevant there you know, when you're listening to the tape you know, is this idea that like, yes, the LA productions absolutely do hire people you know, from Vancouver and from other markets. Like it, it does happen. Uh, in that specific example that Stuart shared, this is somebody who's already working professionally, right? And, and so had, because they were in a smaller market and were getting professional work, they then had a resume that helped them be a credible option. Now, what happens if you are not legal to work in the US? If, if you're a Canadian citizen or you're from the UK or, uh, something like that, and a production in the U.S. wants to hire you uh, to work on a show that shoots in the U.S., well, then you have to get what's called an O-1 visa. So I quickly pulled up a couple of websites on O-1 visas. Uh, let me show you what I found. Yeah, and knowing what the, uh, the thing that Canadians need is, you can probably go and find out uh, much, much, much more information you know, than I've been able to summarize here. You know, and sometimes it's just knowing what to look for. You know, so what is an O-1 visa? O-1 visa is a non-immigrant visa used by a small percentage of individuals who possess extraordinary ability in the arts, sciences, education, or athletics, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so here's what uh, the U.S. Immigration, uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services uh, has to say. Right, individuals with an extraordinary ability. Application process. A US employer, US agent, or foreign employer working through a US agent should file blah, 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 a million forms, very complicated. So uh, typically, O-1 visas are facilitated by, the, uh, by a production company in the States. Now, in order for them to do that, you know, again, Stuart's example of you know, one of the lead actors in Glee you know, here was a character that they were having trouble casting in LA. LA is this huge market, but they had something very specific in mind. They also wanted somebody who was like this kind of charismatic and had that kind of experience with musical theater. They're having trouble finding it. You know, and so they started, uh, they extended the search. Obviously, when they hired uh, uh, Corey Monteith, you know, the, they uh, would have done this process, you know, sort of through the production. It is possible for somebody to get a lawyer and apply for an O-1 visa. Let's look at one of the websites that talks a little bit about that. I don't have any relationship with this website. Uh, this is just one of the things that showed up first in Google. Uh, so O-1 visa for Canadian citizens of extraordinary ability. Uh, Non-immigrant, da-da-da, we've seen this already. Uh, what is considered extraordinary ability? Uh, the uh, the uh, U.S. Customs Immigration Service determines that an individual possesses extraordinary ability. They've sustained national or international claim, widely recognized as being one of the very best in his or her field. Uh, the, a level of expertise indicating the person is one of the small percentages has risen to the very top of the field of endeavor. For O-1B visas in the field of arts, motion picture, or television, 
They use the term distinction, which is a high level of achievement in the field of the arts, evidenced by degree of skill and recognition substantially above that ordinarily encountered to the extent that you know, the person is described as prominent, as renowned, leading well-known field there. Okay, so um, when I've had clients who are applying for these, they basically, first they have to either find like a lawyer uh, or a production company or an agent you know, down in the States who's going to sort of like champion that process or have to, they have to pay somebody to do that. Then they have to collect letters from producers they've worked for, from uh, casting directors in uh, Canada, you know, from uh, production people in the States saying, yes, you know, Duke is exceptionally talented, you know, and, you know, I'd like, I would hire him in a second, you know, like, or he worked on my last project, you know, that we shot in Canada, you know, and, you know, like, I wish we could hire him in the States, you know, here's a bunch of reasons why. Uh, and even then, my understanding is that it is not guaranteed. You know, uh, so that's the application process for an O-1 visa. I would say it's not something to hang your hat on. You're much more likely to get cast uh, for a project that is shooting locally that you can legally work for, just because it's going to cost them less money and be less hassle. You know, so uh, the uh, so the I think that the actor path you know, to working in Los Angeles still is you know. Uh, like I said, you I, you could you know potentially like go to a school down there, you know, and uh, there may be like a student visa that allows you to stick around for a year or two and like try and get some work. All right, so it's possible that you could do that. I think that your best bet probably is to build a resume uh, in your home market, you know, such that you know you are considered uh, competitive. Yeah, and you can go down there with your resume, and that of course sort of weeds you out of like all of the folks you know, who, like I said, are sort of coming from all over the world because they want to act. And if you show up and you're like, here are my credits, look, you know, I've already done this professionally. That's one of the things that sort of cuts the chatter. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a huge role either. Like there was a time where uh, a friend of mine had a, a small role, you know, uh, that a recurring character on the show Once Upon a Time. And uh, because that show was like really, really big, you know, in, in the years when he was working on it, uh, even though he appeared just like very infrequently, like a little bit in this episode, a little bit in that episode, suddenly he had a whole bunch of agents and managers in the States, you know, who were like actively interested in meeting with him and forming relationships with him. He spent some time uh, down in LA, you know, just leveraging that. So it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to like work as leads a bunch here. You just have to get enough of a resume you know, that folks down there are like, oh, this person is marketable and here's the proof. So uh, it's you know possible, but more difficult. You know, one of the things uh, that I think I said to Ozzy is that it's like, you know, uh, the, it's like, it's like winning the lottery, but it's a, like, you have know, lots more tickets. Right, so uh, you're, it's it's still possible. You know, it's just that like the reason it's a big deal and makes the you know, front page of the entertainment section, you know, or you know, like makes the circulation on social media when somebody sort of like gets lifted into uh, you know, the lead in some huge U.S. shows because it's very, 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 very rare. Uh, now, uh, Duke is an interesting example because before uh, the lesson he was like, well, I can work in both. Like I'm a dual citizen. You know, how do I take advantage of that? Or is there a way for me to take advantage of that? You know, and I would say that um, for like, a, again, probably the best way to take advantage of that is to get credits in a smaller market. You know, and then when you go and uh, approach managers and talent agents, you get to say, and I'm legal to work here, you know, which most of the emails coming in you know, from outside of Los Angeles will not have. In fact, you know, probably once you've got you know, some credits that your agent thinks they can help you leverage, they may even help you find a manager you know, or uh, be willing to participate in those conversations you know, or kind of participate in negotiating with folks uh, down in the States you know, because they want to eat. You know, and uh, the, it's really normal for actors in LA to have both a manager and a talent agent. You know, of course, each of those folks takes a percentage of the money you make. But if you don't make any money, they don't take any money from you. So, you know, like cry all the way to the bank. You're like, oh, my manager and agent take so much of the much, much, much money I'm taking. You know, like that's not going to earn you a lot of sympathy from most film and TV actors. And it's not something, you know, that I think uh, most folks are going to need to like worry about right away. You know, so the hopefully, uh, Duke, there is an opportunity to leverage the ability to work in different markets. 
you know, but I think that the first thing to do is to establish that credibility either you simply through what you're doing right now which is like a slow accumulation of skill you know so that you're like well i can take opportunities no matter where they present themselves so you know i can um submit myself for tapes for instance if you go to um, actorsaccess.com uh, which is a division of breakdown services it is possible to create a free account there and see like you uh, would, uh, Duke, I know, uses uh, a website called Vancouver Actors Guide uh, to find independent film, student film auditions. Uh, in Los Angeles, there are plenty of you know, low paying or non paying productions that do post to Actors Access. You know, it's just that, you know, of course, folks in LA are also watching those carefully. But if you can work there and you're like, well, I'd love to work in LA and I don't mind hopping a plane if I actually book something. You know, then you absolutely could sort of check that every day and you know, uh, submit yourself uh, there. You know, and uh, and there's a lot of you can do a lot of that without you know, paying money. I, I don't know other sources you know, for LA based auditions, you know, but just be aware that anytime you do that, you're competing against everybody who's there and local. You know, and and you might find yourself in the position you know where you would need to take a plane down there for a callback you know even if it was a project that didn't pay you any money so like are you at the point there where uh, yet where that feels like a good priority for an indie project you know or a student film from ucla you know, that's a judgment call for you to make All right so the um but uh, but top level if you can work in the states it just means that when people want you and are interested in you it's one less barrier you know, it doesn't necessarily make people go, whoa, you can work here, great, because they've already got like millions upon millions of people who live there and can work there. You know, uh, but it does mean, you know, that once you can open those doors, or you see like a little crack in those doors, you don't have that barrier. You know, and it's anecdotal, but I know at least one actor who got all the way to, you know, the, the final two for uh, a lead in an NBC TV series during pilot season in L.A., uh, and um, when they found out he didn't have an O-1 visa, they're like, oh, sorry, no. Right? They, they just didn't want to do the work. They didn't want to take the chance that it would be delayed or slow down production in any way. You know, we don't know why they made that decision, but that is a thing that happens. We're like, oh, okay, you know, like, we really like you, but it's easier, cheaper, you know, safer bet to go with this person, you know, and, and of course, that's only if those two things are equal, you know, which is why the first thing of like, just get, like, what can you do today to build your skill so that you're moving towards the point where you're just skilled enough, they can't afford not to hire you, like, you know, that's a real thing, you know, and, you know, it's never a guarantee, which I keep saying in these lessons, but it is the thing that you can do for yourself, because that's what sort of cuts the chatter, right? It's only the idea that like, well, both of these people are completely equal in terms of their you know, performance, their skill, their personality. Well, then, yeah, they're going to hire the person who they don't have to get a visa for. But if they're looking at them and they're like, well, but just Duke's got like the uh, a take on this character that we can't get anybody else to do is you know, maybe that's worth you know, the extra hassle, maybe, you know, but what you say, uh, but Duke particularly doesn't have an extra hassle. So that's a, uh, hopefully that ends up being an asset for him at some point in his career, right? That also means that like, I don't know if you're like, I'm tired of working in the smaller market of Vancouver and I want an adventure. You could go move to another like bustling smaller market like Atlanta and be like, I'm going to live in Atlanta for a couple of years. I wonder if I'll get more work there. You know, uh, no skin off my back. I'll give it a shot. You know, and uh, and you could you know, bounce around you know having those adventures you know if that also seemed like it would be good or useful for your career so there is your kind of lowdown on uh, the uh, LA market you know there is a um, uh, there's another video from last year uh, that uh, that I didn't go over in detail <laughs> you can tell from last year because I've got some of my COVID beard. Uh, the but ask me anything auditions online LA versus Vancouver and more uh, all of these of course are in the my free acting class video archive so uh, with the last few minutes I want to review a video by the fabulous Dia Sony uh, who uh, last week submitted a audition that she was working on and I want to show you the difference between even just like the first 15 seconds of the tape so this keeps coming up in self tapes 
So again, the sort of quick technical uh, overview, you know, eye line is the line between your eyes and what you're looking at, right? If you want to make sure both eyes are like near enough to camera, they're, they're very clearly visible. So if I turn uh, enough that my nose is starting to cut off this eyeball, probably that's too far off to one side. We want to, you know, my eye line to be nice close to the camera. When eye light, light reflecting your eyes, what makes you look alive on camera? Otherwise, you look kind of dead inside. Uh, neutral background, it really should, at this point, can just be a plain wall. Some folks, uh, and Dia likes, you know, a like bright blue, you know, kind of blue screeny background, which is usually just like a stretched piece of blue fabric, or some people just like will paint a wall in their house bright blue. Uh, I used to do that, and then my agent was like, actually, I just like the tan better. So, great, this is even easier for me than stretching up my backdrop. You know, uh, my agent is the marketing professional, I take her advice. And I advise that you do too. Uh, and I can send you a link to the whole lesson that where I talked about that for way too long. So you can hear me say it over and over again. Uh, the right, so the you also want to make sure that your audio is clearer, uh, like that your voice is clearer than uh, your reader. But in this case, Dia's doing a monologue, so that's not going to come up. Uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting about self tapes, now that the self tapes are the norm, is that. Uh, they don't have to watch all of them, right? They can they can see more auditions than they used to, you know, which is great. It creates more opportunities for folks who are new, but it also means that the first 15, 20 seconds uh, is getting progressively more important because if you don't grab them right away, if they're not like, yeah, we definitely see this person could be the character or there's something really alive and interesting, we can see who they are as a person, then, pot then potentially, um, unless they're Canadian and very, very polite, yeah, probably even then, if they've watched several hundred of them in the day, uh, I think there is a tendency to watch just the first little bit and be like, mm, you know, not exactly yes, no, but like no or maybe, you know, and, and right, and the maybe is still, they're going to watch all the way through, you know, but if they can disqualify you like nice and early, you know, if they've got 60 tapes to watch, uh, the ones that they can disqualify, I think, save them work. You know, and I've heard, at least anecdotally, from directors and producers, that's some of how they're making their decision as well, right? They're, you know, um, like we all do, making a decision from an emotional place and then looking for reasons afterwards. You know? And so that can happen very, very rapidly. And so I think when you see uh, Dia's tapes, uh, you will get a sense of that yourself. So here, if I remember correctly, is this is the tape from... Uh, that we viewed last week. And so we just watched the first, say, 15 seconds of this one. Now 75 pounds. I lost 75 pounds. And you're sorry. Okay. Yeah, and so, uh, oh. <laughs> Just want to see your eyeballs. Good. So uh, what we've got is neutral background. You know, she's in head and shoulders framing. We are not seeing anything above her head or down below her armpits. You know, so that's the medium close up you want for a uh, self tape. Right. Technically, this says, oh, this person knows what they're doing. Uh, the we talk. If you want like a detailed breakdown, you know, of all of my thoughts on this one, you're just gonna have to watch the like the last 15 minutes of last week's. Uh, your book. instead, I'm just gonna show you the new one for reference. Check this out. Yeah, so uh, she did a couple of takes for us, you know, and I want to watch the first one and talk about it in detail. Now, already this looks crisper, and I wonder if that's uh, because this one was recorded in higher resolution, you know, or if it was just uploaded in higher resolution. You know, that's sort of uh, neither here nor there. You know, like obviously that's uh, you know, work that you probably yeah, <laughs> so, yep, high resolution upload, uh, right? The as long as it's sort of you know, nice and crisp, it usually doesn't have to be huge you know, when you send it uh, to uh, uh, to casting. Uh, it was rough the last time. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at uh, this one, and even just these first 15, 20 seconds. I lost 75 pounds. Five pounds, and you're sorry. You're sorry. You're sorry. After I wait for you. Okay, so we're 18 seconds in, you know, and we're seeing much more of her eyes, right? So it's like crisper, clearer, 
you know, and uh, so you can see how that makes you know her look like a better actor because we can just see more of what's going on. But also, as part of that is that we're seeing more of her eyes. Uh, the right, the pacing is better. You know, there's more nuance, and a lot of these lines, in, lines to me in this one sound more grounded, right? So there are these like pops of strong feeling you know, that are, I think, uh, really necessary to bring something like this alive. You know, and the foundation of it of it to me reads as she's just talking, uh, and we believe that she's a real person. And, and just remember that with film TV acting, that is always the foundation. Is that we got to believe that this is just you talking kind of all, all of the feeling stuff is bonus so you know, uh, to me this is much much more effective no not three is for my entire life after i plan my entire future around our wedding after i base my entire concept of uh, self-esteem on the fact that you're willing to marry me and i'm sorry Thank God my parents are dead. This would have killed them. Really? Was there any other time you might have told me this? I'm wearing the wedding dress that you picked out. I got highlights in my hair because you said, you said, what, it added shimmer? And so uh, Dia and I talked a little bit about this tape before I started recording today's session, you know, but Dia, looking at this, uh, I hope that you can see where there's just that, right, there's the strength in it, you know, I can see the, the characters, you know, like, you know, uh, fierce, this or self-protection or anger, whatever word we want to put you know, to that experience showing up. And there's also just like a smidge of apology and it's like fierce and, you know, and the, um, and so that's the thing where I think it might be useful for you to work on characters that are just like very clear, clear, clean, angry, powerful, so that you can give us like even just like a line or two of like a really clear, really fierce, and then let it shift. But I still uh, really stand by what I said in last week's lesson, which is that ultimately you've got to show up as you for something like this. And we got to see who you are as a person. I think you did a great job of that in this day. I loved you, and I believed in you, and I pretended not to notice that Streisand thing. I thought you were just creative. I thought you were smarter than me. I thought you were just sensitive, more interesting. I thought you were the most wonderful man in the world. I thought you were going to change my whole life and show me the world and teach me about life and art and magic and make me feel like the most beautiful woman in the world. One of the things that's so beautiful about that moment idea that I just want to point out to you and the people watching you know, is that rather than trying to put the feeling on the line, what happened was we saw a moment of feeling come up for the character that you then had to overcome and come back to the thing you were trying to accomplish. And I think that for an audience is much, much more effective in uh, conveying story and conveying feeling. It's also much more sophisticated. It's also much harder for the actor to do. Um, but to me, especially as an actor, it's so much more interesting to watch something like that. So, didn't mean to interrupt your big finish, but you know, let's just go back and watch. I feel like the most beautiful woman in the world instead of. Okay, where are we? Magic. All right, simple heartfelt. Make me feel like the most beautiful woman in the world instead of. Right, and so there's that moment of uh, emotionality that then she has to sort of move past to accomplish what she's doing. I think that that goal or objective or want is so key in storytelling. So. 
Thank you for those of you who joined us live and in person today. Dia, thank you so much for submitting your tape last week and this week. Uh, those of you uh, who are watching this on YouTube, send us your self-tapes, info at myfreeactingclass.com. We'd love to include those. Uh, Duke sent a message earlier in the chat window saying that like, he had one this week, but it just it was not family friendly. And so uh, he decided to spare us. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And you know, because I just don't have the tech skills to like bleep out you know, all of the parts or, you know, I mean, I'm supposed to be always look at it and I can be like, camera technique, and we're just going to listen to him say the first you know, two words or something. But uh, you know, feel free to see, uh, send in any kind of tape. Yeah, and I, at the very least, you know, I can uh, you know, talk technique yeah, and we can talk story a little bit. So I hope that you can join us next Monday. Uh, these lessons right now are happening on Mondays, 5 to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And uh, you can find out the link and all the details and also join the mailing list at myfreeactingclass.com. I'm acting teacher Michael Bean. Thanks for joining us today.